All right, so this video is on the different shapes that electrons make in covalent compounds using the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, sometimes called VESPER. And it's about the idea that simply that electrons in chemical bonds or in lone pairs around the central atom of a covalently bonded molecule will take on a certain shape. That shape changes its chemistry um, in terms of polarity and sometimes its ability to bond or not bond. Three-dimensional shapes are very important in organic or covalent compounds. So let's begin. So the first type of uh, bonding we have is between a central atom and two other atoms. Like the example I've given is BEF2, where the bonding between the central atom and the two fluorines are sp hybridized. One s and one p came together to make two equal energies. And they would have two pairs of electrons, two pairs of electrons, repel themselves around a central atom in a 180 bond angle. And you'd expect this because if you had one pair of electrons and another, they would clearly repel themselves in a 180 bond angle. So there we go. Hydrogen gas, by the way. Hydrogen. Nitrogen gas, by the way. And I'll do my best to make these nice little bonds here. So the central atom is where my thumb or my fingers are, and I'm just going to tie these together. And clearly, I'm going to make, hopefully, a linear shape if I could tie these. Big fingers, small balloons. Okay, so that would be a 180 shape. So anything that's sp hybridized, where a combination of 1p and 1s would make two equal orbitals at the same energy level, some are in between, okay, and have a bond angle of 180. And the reason why there's a bond angle of 180 is that there's no central electrons to bond in any other direction. Lone pairs are bonding. Electrons around a central atom will take the shape or take some stable shape based on the repulsion of other electrons. That's the best for theory. Okay, so let's add another pair of electrons. Okay, so now we're going to have a central covalent compound with three pairs of electrons. Now these three pairs could be bonding or non-bonding. It does not matter as long as it's around a central atom. So take this balloon, tie it to the 180 or the sp hybridized, and this is the shape that another hybrid orbital will take. Notice the shape is triangular, and it's in the same plane. So this is called tri trigonal or triangular planar. You'll hear both of them used. And count the orbitals. One holds two electrons. This one holds two. This one. This is S and two Ps come together and always form a triangular planar shape, a geometric shape, if there, in fact, is things bonded to the uh, middle compound, like BF3. Okay? So... Um, this is the family name for trigonal planar for sp2 hybridization. I know it's sp2 because I'm counting 1s and 2ps mixed together, three orbitals in, three orbitals out, and that's the shape. Okay, now, that's the family. I call it the family shape or electron domain geometry, the geometry of electrons, whether or not you have electrons there. But if you have things bonded, I'm sorry, non-bonding pair, if this was a lone pair, you can see that it's still a trigonal planar shape, but we would call it bent if things are actually bonded here. So there's a geometric shape, and then there's the electron domain shape. Electron domain shape is always trigonal planar because few pairs of electrons will repel themselves into the shape. But you're going to have now um, a shape here that's due to just atoms. If two atoms bonding here in a lone pair, this would be bent. So bent and trigonal planar are the two shapes in sp2 hybridization. Let's go ahead another pair of electrons. That means now we're going to have four orbitals. Four pairs of electrons surrounding the central atom is what we expect for a lot of our uh, uh, row two or principal energy level two atoms like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. They want to have that stable octet. You've heard that already. Well, that means an S and Oh, um, three Ps have mixed and hybridized in this valence shell theory to give us something called a, it looks like it's planar, but 
this is a tetrahedral. Okay, this lone pair bends this downward, although I think I made a couple of these blooms too big. And it's very symmetrical. So it's a tetrahedral family. And this family, for sp3 hybridization, which we expect for a lot of our octet row um, two elements, okay, is if you have methane, CH4, okay, that'd be the hybridization and the shape. 109 bond angles. And by the way, that the uh, bond angles for the, um, for the um, trigonal planar, if I can get this out of the way, was 120. Okay, but we have a couple of shapes in this family. Electron domain geometry, sp3 hybridization. If I've got one lone pair, then I have a top of a three-sided triangle called trigonal, um, uh, trigonal pyramidal. Okay, top of a three-sided pyramid. And if I take out two of these balloons as lone pairs, they bend these two down. So if the green and white were lone pairs, they would bend the red downward into a bent shape. So the bent shape pops in for geometric shapes, okay, if there's lone pairs in this family. So we have three shapes, tetrahedral, all filled, one, oh, one lone pair, trigonal, uh, pyramidal, okay, top of a three-sided pyramid. If there's two lone pairs, you've got that bent shape. And again, pick any two you want, I'll pick two red bending downward. But sp3 hybridization gives you four equal pairs of electrons. Now, as I had mentioned, we have elements beyond row two that can, uh, can covalently bond, and they have something called expanded octets because they can make more than eight electrons involved in their covalent bonding. And the reasoning is that energy level three atoms or elements have the D sublevel to take part of that mixing and hybridization. So there are elements that can have five pairs of electrons. That's right, 10 electrons surrounding the central atom. It goes beyond the octet that eight that we talk about so much. We call these expanded octets. So if I add a fifth pair, and this would only be for elements, at least in the third energy level, that incorporates the D. So fifth orbital, that means S, three P's, well, I'm out of P's, right? So S, P, three, and now I'm incorporating that D. So I take my tetrahedral, and I add, <laughs> I add a balloon, okay, to my four orbitals, okay? Of course, I lost an orbital, so now I'm still at a tetrahedral, so I'm gonna need another orbital that I'll add again, so. Murphy's law comes into play. So let's add another orbital. I just lost an orbital, so I added my fifth. And now, that was my fourth I just added, now my fifth. So I have my tetrahedral back because I lost the balloon. Now I'm going to bring this here, tie it up real nicely. Nicely. Okay. Birthday clown, I'm not. And what we get, as we get eventually get a stable structure, we get this, we get that trigonal planar in the middle, okay, as you can see, and we have this something called axial positions, my two hands are in the axial positions, and of course, these are the equatorial positions, so you got that trigonal, oops, trigonal planar in the middle, and that linear on the bottom, this is called a tri, tri, uh, triagonal bipyramidal, okay, trigonal bipyramidal family, okay, and this is with five lobes of electrons. Expanded octet, sp3d, okay, is a family. And we have some shapes according to this. We have the trigonal bipyramidal shape if you've got all five. One lone pair is going to be a seesaw, hard to see that here. Three lone pairs is going to be a T-shape, so if this is the lone pairs, okay, you get a T-shaped, okay, and three lone pairs, and they're always in the equator positions, okay, so if the equator is with three lone positions, we get a, a, a just a linear, and we'll look that up. Hard to see that here, but the basic family name, okay, is the trigon trigonal bipyramidal, bipyramid, three-sided pyramid, okay? Hopefully we don't lose another one. And we have one more. So that would be sp3d2 is the one that's coming up. I'm adding another balloon here that represents another electron pair that can exist in an area called an orbital. So, one S, three P's, now two S's, I'm sorry, one S, three P's, and two D's give me sp 3 d 2 And that's a total of six pairs of electrons that can exist. And again, 
I'm not much of a birthday clown, but I can do this. All right, and now, lo and behold, the stable state is going to be this square in the middle that's planar and the two axial positions. This is called an octahedral because there's actually eight sides to this. This is a triangle here, triangle in front, triangle in behind and the side. It's four sides here and four sides in the bottom. But this is the family name of an octahedral for sp3 d2 hybridization. If we have six pairs of electrons surrounding a central atom, has to be for an expanded octet, incorporate the d's, you have this shape, and there's some other shapes associated with this family. You have, um, if you, the, the other uh, sp3d, the trigonal bipyramidal family, the lone pairs are in the equator positions. In this family, the sp3d2 octahedral family, the lone pairs are always going to be in the uh, axial positions for stability purposes. So one lone pair is atop of a four-sided uh, pyramid. So if the, the green was a lone pair, considering the shape now, it would be called a square pyramidal, square pyramid, okay, for an obvious reason. And if you have another lone pair, so if the purple, I guess, and the green are lone pairs, we'd have square planar, okay, and those are the shapes, okay. The family names are very, very important and they tell us something about the shape, the polarity, and chemical reactivity based on how electrons repel themselves. So if you look back on your worksheets that I've given you, think of the basic family names of shapes, and the shapes they take up make some sense based on how they repel themselves in VESPER theory.